So our first talk today is George Gannon from the Institute for Regional Conservation. And we are really lucky to have George here. He is a worldwide expert. I knew that I had learned a lot from him. And um, the Institute is headquartered right here in Delray Beach. We have multiple projects that are going on at our parks and also on our dude. And George is going to talk um, about those and uh, and general habitat restoration and the value of that. So, George. Thanks, Kent. And good morning, everybody. Happy Earth Month. And uh, we're going to jump in. So we're going to talk about restoring ecosystems for people in nature. And I'm going to talk about this from two perspectives. One is as the executive director and uh, chief conservation strategist for the Institute for Regional Conservation, and also as international policy lead for the Society for Ecological Restoration. So we're going to look at how we're going to put this idea of, of restoration um, together from the local to the global perspective. So first we want to talk about um, uh, IRC a little bit. And so what we do is uh, we unite global thinking with local action and local expertise. And we developed a whole bunch of different kinds of tools for people all over South Florida, from a regional flora to guide, you know, planting guides for, um, for, for barrier islands and pine rocklands in Miami-Dade County and so forth. So all of these resources are free and accessible to anybody that wants to use them, and they are widely used by both uh, by, the, by the public, by practitioners, and by scientists. So one of our major programs is our, um, our, our uh, ecological restoration program, and a major component of that is community outreach or stakeholder engagement. So e we have a team that's based in Miami that's a professional team that does ecological restoration, primarily working in uh, Pine Rocklands, but they've been, we've been bringing them up here to work in Barrier Island, uh, some Barrier Island projects in, in Boca and in Palm Beach. They've helped here in the, uh, in the interior at Barwick and Orchard View that we'll talk about in a little bit. But essential to that is, just essential to the success of all of that is, um, is outreach to the public like we're doing today. So we, we need people, the local folks, to understand what's going on, why we're doing what we're doing, and why it's important. Without that support, without your support of people in the room, then people are not gonna understand what's going on and why it's important. And, um, and, and so you can get pushback from the community if they don't understand the purpose of, of what it is that we're trying to achieve. So we also um, contribute to global guidance on, on ecological and ecosystem restoration. So IRC's contributed to um, the international principles and standards for the practice of ecological restoration. We'll talk about that more in a moment. But also, um, we're in the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, and IRC has contributed both to the principles of, for the decade and also to the standards of practice that were just released. And the, just to give you kind of an idea of the scope of this work, the International Principles and Standards for the Practice of Ecological Restoration was released in 2019. And it, is, it underpins, it's, it's cited in the UN Decade Strategy, and it's used um, as, a, as a framework to build the decade around. And it has um, a huge amount of, of traction globally with 75,000 downloads. Prior to this, the most downloaded paper in the journal Restoration Ecology had about 15,000 downloads, so this is just blowing all records out of the water. And it's also already been cited almost uh, 1,200 times in scientific literature. This is a big number um, for something that's only been published less than five years. All right, so we're gonna pivot to Florida. So here we are. Um, and everybody knows a little bit about the modern settlement of Florida. Florida is um, was one of the last places in the continental United States to be settled. Um, the, the, the lower peninsula wasn't really settled until after 1900. And so we have this big influx of people that occurred, but we have a pretty good idea of what was here historically because of that late arrival of intense um, uh, colonization. And so what we have today is this picture here. So on the left, this is a map from the Florida Natural Areas Inventory. And it shows the conservation system that we have. And um, if you look at the, at the text at the top, the global target for protected areas uh, prior to 2020 was 
and that has now been elevated to 30%. So the goal for 2030 is to have 30% of terrestrial areas protected globally. So we have more than that. But what we know from South Florida is that it's not enough. And the reason is, if you look at the map on the left, but also the figure on the right, the satellite image, you can see that people are located in a very particular area. So we have the Everglades and the Big Cypress and big freshwater wetland areas are protected, and that's all good, but the biodiversity, the native plants and animals that make up South Florida are not evenly distributed across the, the landscape. They're located primarily in the uplands, in the coastal uplands, on the Atlantic Coastal Strip, but also the uplands in Southwest Florida and the Florida Keys. So to give you a perspective of what we're dealing with here in Del Rey, this is a, a picture of North Boca, Del Rey, and South Boynton. And so let's see if I can make this happen. The only, the only protected area in Del Rey that's on this map is the Leon Weeks Preserve, okay? That's it. There's, no, there's nothing else in Del Rey that makes it onto the Florida Natural Areas Inventory map of protected areas. Okay, so we have, so this is Seacrest Scrub. Um, this is Delray Oaks, so sorry, that is in Delray. That's a Palm Beach County site. Um, this is the Delray Beach site. And then, um, and then you have the uh, Green Cay Wetland here. And then there, there are some remnant pine flatwoods here at um, the museum, Morikami, right? right? So the, most of the areas that we're gonna talk about today whether they're on the barrier island or in the interior, don't make it on the map. That does not mean that they're not important. It actually means that they're more important because there's a lack of recognition of their value, okay? All right, so we're gonna look at the barrier island for a minute because this is where we've spent uh, most of our work um, over the last several years. This is actually a picture of the town of Palm Beach. So this is, uh, say, the 1950s, and so you can see by this time that the barrier island is completely built out. All the natural areas in the barrier island are gone, but you can also see the impact of coastal erosion. So you have this hard um, engineering going on along the coastline, and the, the dune system has basically been washed into the ocean. This is Delray Beach. So this is uh, some photos that, uh, that, that Kent and, and others in the city got together. And this shows you that kind of the hard engineering that people were thinking was a good idea. This is how we're going to protect the coastline. And you can see that it was just a complete failure, right? Um, we could go into why all that has happened, um, but we don't really need to do that. Uh, so by 1970, um, all of that hard um, engineering was beginning to be removed throughout South Florida. Okay, so it's not just Del Rey or Palm Beach, it's also down on Miami Beach and other places where extreme erosion occurred because of over-engineered coastlines. So what happened is that uh, once the recognition was that engineering was uh, not the way to go, that it was failing, um, so there was the renourishment, okay, process began, putting sand back on the beaches, and then what do we do? And um, I was involved in a similar project in on Miami Beach in 1985, where, where the, you know, the recognition was that, that soft engineering using native plants and native landscapes was the way to go. And so e even in Del Rey, um, this was uh, occurring. So this is a 1985 image, and you can see in the background. However, this is an exotic invasive scavola, which is prevalent on the dune system now, but also some sea grape here. So there were some folks in, in, in the town and also uh, in the city and also um, the city itself uh, and Fairchild Tropical Garden and others that started to, to work on this. Rob Barron is a person that, that spent a lot of time working on the municipal beach. So this is an image of the municipal beach in Delray and you can see that this is a, a, a biodiverse, a well-designed beach planting. So this is not one of the many beach plantings that you see especially now where it's, it's two or three species of plants. This is a pretty biodiverse thing that's actually using a native ecosystem as a reference. And there was also work in this early period on rare species. So this is a, a map of the federally endangered beach jacquamania. And so there was a planting done. So this is the area where the sailboats are parked along the municipal beach. And so this is, uh, 
these are the Jacomanias that were, that were uh, planted in that area in 2005, that's a map. And that population still exists. We're actually gonna have a field trip specifically to go and look. This is one of the best um, reintroduction of Jacomania that's, that's ever been done. And then IRC enters the picture in 2016 when we began work at Atlantic Dunes Park. So we had a variety of funding mechanisms, but we moved our headquarters here um, around 2011 or 2012, and we began work at Atlantic Dunes Park um, right away. And Vinny uh, knows that park very well in the audience. All right, so in 2019, we did a few small projects, and in 2019, we um, received funding from Impact 100 Palm Beach County, and. Um, and we have uh, done a whole bunch of uh, projects through Restoring the Gold Coast with funding from Impact 100, New York Life, and then later with the Community Foundation of Palm Beach and Martin Counties. And the idea was to get people to understand that uh, biodiversity restoration, that we would be bringing in native plants that were missing from the system. So, so now we know that there are 250 to 300 species of native plants that were historically found on the barrier island in this area and well over half of those were either completely gone or had been um, depleted down to just a few individuals in a few small areas. So the project involved uh, um, initially focusing on planting of uh, native species that had been lost from the system or been depleted, and dozens of different species were put out in uh, on the municipal beach, Atlantic Dunes Park, Boca, Boynton, um, all the way up to uh, uh, well, basically as far north as, as, as Boynton. All right, so then we're gonna talk about sea grapes a little bit. Um, some of you may know about the sea grape controversy in, in Del Rey, okay? But historically, and we'll look, at, we'll look at the reference model, but historically, sea grapes were not trees in the landscape. Sea grapes were very short shrubs. We'll look at some images of that so you can get a picture of that. Um, but the height and the spread of sea grapes basically covers up all that diversity. So you think about the slide of those dozens of species that grew in the coastal strand and the beach, and what happens is when sea grapes get into the system and they grow, you basically have a monoculture of a single species that basically kills everything underneath them. So because people have been educated to appreciate trees, and we like people to appreciate trees, and trees are important, but trees have a place just like everything else, and so we, um, we put together some outreach materials and did some field trips and some other things to try and explain to people what had happened over time. So if you remember back to that earlier image about the dune planting, there were some sea oats and there was some scavola and there was a few, there were some sea grapes, but they were even at that time were, were very short. So there were never any big tree sea grapes in, in the landscape. And here, what's, what we wanna show is that this is, this is the pioneer zone the front of the dune, and this is the coastal strand where we've done restoration at Atlantic Dunes Park. So you can see the difference between, this is the sea grape in the system that's grown up, but this is where all of the biodiversity, this is where all the native plants are, the native butterflies, the native birds, this is where they all live. And so this is more similar to the, the, the system that existed before um, everything changed. So here's the, here's the reference condition. So this is what the barrier island looked like uh, prior to, to settlement. So it was short, right? And it went from the dune all the way back to the, to the intracoastal, which at the time was a freshwater system. Really different from what we see today, right? And even as late as 1991, okay, we have images, this is Atlantic Dunes Park, so this is an existing path. If you go to Atlantic Dunes Park, you'll know where this curve in the path is. So that still exists, and this is the curve in the path here. So this whole area, you can see how short the sea grapes and the cocoa plum are very short, yeah? And you can see what's happened. So this is Brazilian pepper and sea grape that have come in and invaded that area. Um, so we have a good reference. We know what this looked like historically and we know how to um, engineer our, our thinking about restoration. So we also have images in the, in the back where there was Jacomani Atlantic Dunes Park. So we have these historical records from Fairchild of where the Jacomani was, the federally listed wildflower. And this is an image from some, some work in 2003 to try and restore habitat for the beach jacquemania. 
And this is an image from 2022 from basically the same area. So the Brazilian peppers come in, and the sea grapes have spread, and the habitat for the jacomania is completely gone. So the good news is, with support from the city, Kent, and sustainability, and parks, and, and uh, public works, and we've been working in Atlantic Dunes Park, as I said, and we're continuing to push forward. So this giant open area that we just replanted with coastal strand plants, which are gonna be short, provide habitat for jacomania, um, this did not involve any sea grape trimming. This was just removal of invasive species. So you can get an idea of kind of the openness that used to exist in this area um, and that we're pushing, <coughs> pushing forward with the restoration. And then I want to, um, to describe uh, the fact that, that the rarest, the rarest uh, system is not coastal strands. So we have the beach dune in the front, the short, shrubby coastal strand that was the majority of the barrier islands, and then historically, we had a freshwater body in the back. What's completely lost from the barrier island system are freshwater wetlands, and this is critically important for wildlife. So without fresh water, you lose all kinds of species, you lose even things like birds that need fresh water and so forth. And so we have to actually dig in to try and figure out what did this look like, right? So we lost the intercoastal, we lost the whole giant, big freshwater system, but there were freshwater wetlands embedded in the barrier island. So where the dunes came over and there was a little dip, you have a freshwater wetland. There's still one remnant in Ocean Ridge. If you go to Ocean Ridge Hammock Park, there's actually a little swale remaining um, on the southwest part of the park. I'll talk to you after, I'll talk to you after. And, and there's still pond apple and some other freshwater species there, but it's covered up by trees and historically. So we know, um, we know from, from things like this, where you can see uh, descriptions of, of, of wetlands and, and so forth, and look at the lake. This was a freshwater lake behind this structure. This is it now, right? So this is what's happened. It's, 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 it's dredge and fill. It happened all over Florida, but on a micro scale in the Barrier Islands, we've lost really critical habitat. We know nothing about that habitat. There are none remain, right, in any kind of good shape. So we've actually can, can create ideas of what that might look like by looking at constructed wetlands and see what species actually do well. What, what, and so there's some examples at Pan's Garden, for example. And this, this is a retention area in Ocean Ridge, just across the bridge, and so we can get an idea of how those freshwater wetlands might function. But this would again be something we're not working on now, but it's something that um, that people should pay attention to and think about because without this fresh, these little tiny, small, it could be an area the size of this room, uh, provide huge amounts of habitat for, for wildlife. All right, so now we're gonna switch to the, uh, to the interior. Um, we did a project, uh, uh, the city owns a, a parcel just north of Lake Ida uh, Park, and we did some work there uh, through our, our Green Del Rey program in 2017 to 2019 with support of Community Foundation. And then more recently, um, we've been working in the interior. Okay, so we talked about, we showed you the map, there's just nothing there, right? And so um, there are some very important remnant native areas in the city that Kent has been, and others have been identifying, and, um, and where we're beginning to start work. So this is Orchard View Park. So this is at Lenten, just, um, just east of military. And, um, and, and the, the native trees were just completely overwhelmed by invasive vines. So to the extent that some very large oak trees, like this big, had been killed by, by vines. So um, this was identified as a priority by the city, and IRC helped to initiate restoration there. So to give you an idea, IRC, to do real restoration, you have to use reference, uh, native, ref native reference ecosystems and reference models, so I wanna show you what those might look like. So Orchard View is actually on the edge of the Pineland and the Everglades, but now we can use this hardwood hammock model because this is the pr predominance of trees. There's live oaks and strangler figs and gumbo limbos and other things like this, marlberry, all kinds of native plants are in the system. And so these hammocks are, are hardwood forests that existed as islands in the landscape where they were protected by fire, or protected from fire. And so this is the model that we're gonna use at Orchard View. We're not gonna try to restore uh, the, the Everglades drainage that existed or the pineland that was there because that's not possible given the current conditions. So we use an alternative model of this hardwood hammock at Orchard View. And 
for those who are interested. On May 4th, we're going to have a, an event there. We've been doing some work, and uh, the city has organized some volunteer events there in the past, but IRC is going to hold an event on May 4th at Orchard View to move that restoration process forward. All right, we've also been working at, um, at Barwick Park, and uh, this was historically a pine flatwoods, so this is a pine forest with very low understory vegetation. And so in this case, the vines were running up the pine trees, and there were lots of invasive species had come in uh, into the system, and so we started work there as well. And this is a reference, uh, um, native reference ecosystem that you could use, and this is at Jonathan Dickinson State Park. This is what pine flatwoods should look like, okay? Now we can say that that's not possible to restore in the city of Delray Beach, but actually we have very good evidence and examples from Miami-Dade County where we've been working in very small pine rockland sites, which are very similar to this. And in fact, we can do restoration of pine flatwoods in the urban uh, matrix. So it is possible to do. It's not, I'm not saying it's not a challenge. It is a challenge, but it is possible. All right, so then the next one we've identified, we have not started work here, but we started thinking about it, Bexley Park. Um, which is near Barwick. And um, so this is just this uh, giant kind of mosaic of a few native trees. There's oak trees in there and such, but there's also um, in the foreground, this is the early acacia. Uh, there's melaleuca. There's all kinds of stuff in here. And it's a very, very complex site, and it's going to require some thinking about what to do. But what I want to point out here is that um, there is still evidence of what it used to be. So this is a pine tree, and this is, um, this is a native fern in the understory. And so we can go to the site and we can find out, well, what, are the, what can we learn from the site? What's still there that can give us an idea of what it was and what it could be? And so my, my thinking is that Bexley could be a mosaic restoration where you would have some pine flatwoods and you would have some hardwood hammock. Um, so you can provide shade for people and such, but you can also, we don't want to lose this little bit of habitat that is remnant because it's super valuable. All right, Leon Weeks. Um, so this is down in, in along Federal, just north of the, the Boca um, uh, line. And so this is, uh, this is scrub. So this is a very, it's a, it's a very dry kind of ecosystem, very, very well drained. And you can see here where you've got Schefflera, there's a remnant um, salt palmetto there, but it's just completely overwhelmed by invasive species. This is a system that would burn every 20 or 40 years. Um, and um, and it's, just, it's just completely engulfed by all kinds of bad things. However, um, there's a lot of good there still, right? So you can see the salt palmetto, but there's lots of native plants, but there's also wildlife. So there's a very healthy gopher tortoise population still there at Leon Weeks. And this is really important to, to take care of. So the restoration there would need to take into account the fact that the gopher tortoises are there and there are these other attributes of the system that we want to make sure that we protect. And these are not great pictures, but I'll give you an idea of what, of what scrub and scrubby flatwoods should look like. So a little bit more shrubby, a little less grassy, lots of open sand, um, but an, again, an open system. So one of the key components of, of uh, all of this is engagement with the city and with the city staff and the parks folks that have to actually do work in these areas. And so last year we had, um, we had uh, some training programs that we did uh, over many weeks and I think it was a really good experience for the city and for the guys that were able to, to participate. This is a, this is a, a little confab at uh, Barwick Park. And so some of it is general, how to remove invasive species, to think about how restoration works and so forth. But some of it is very, very specific, such as how to do direct seeding. Um, this is a little direct seeding uh, trial that we did at, at Barwick Park. And so to try to kind of elevate the training of city staff so that people understand how restoration operates and some of the techniques that you could use. And we are, uh, we're happy to announce that we're one of the finalists for, um, for our our new program that's working on these interior sites called the uh, Urban Restoration Team. So the idea is to, is to train uh, both municipal and staff, but also uh, volunteers and others to work on restoration. Um, we have the Restoring the Gold Coast on the Barrier Islands, and so this would be kind of a similar situation for the interior. 
And we'll know in the next few weeks whether we're going to get another batch of funding from Impact 100, but that would really help to elevate our ability. And I want to thank uh, Kent and the city for their support for our application with uh, Impact 100, because that was really key. All right, we're going to spend the last um, few minutes talking about a tool for all of you. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about the background, a little bit about some of the kinds of restoration that IRC is doing in the city. Um, but this, is, this has to do with what every person can do. And, and so this is a tool that you can use for your, for your garden. It can be used at schools. It can be used for roads, you know, roadsides, and so forth. And this is called Natives for Your Neighborhood. And the idea here is that IRC has collected all the information about all of the different native plants that ever grew in South Florida and, uh, and where they were, uh, which ones are in cultivation, and, um, and then took all of that information and this is not an algorithm, this is hard-coded data um, that suggests specific native plants for your, um, for your garden based on your zip code. And this tool, Natives for Your Neighborhood, gets a lot of, uh, a lot of traffic. In 2023, 65,000 users and more than 640,000 page views. So this is a, a well-used tool and it's still being developed. We have resources. Um, from various uh, funders that help us to move the, keep moving the, the, the project forward and continuing to add more information. All right, so you're gonna go to regionalconservation.org and you're gonna click on online resources and select natives for your neighborhood. All right, and so it's really simple. So for me, I live on North Pineapple Grove and so 33444, that's my zip code. I just plop it in here into that little field. And there we go. And then what do you get? So you get lists of plants and they're organized. You can organize them by common name, by scientific name, by, uh, by habit. Uh, you can ask for tree, you know, you can organize them by trees, shrubs, vines, et cetera. And, and so what you get all kinds of information. And so here's a couple of trees that would, uh, that would show up on my list. These are two very common trees, live oak and gumbo limbo, both very common, would show up on my list. Um, but there's also things that people don't have as much information about. And so here are, some, here are some vines. And then one of the things that we do is that we link the native plants to the wildlife that utilize them, right? So in this case, uh, corky stem passionflower is a huge, hugely important plant Everybody, every garden in Delray should have one of these plants. It's a host for three different um, uh, butterflies and um, really, really important. So we try to make those links so it's very easy for people to see. If I plant this, I'm going to get that. If I want that, I need to plant this. Yeah. Um, but also ground covers, um, again, with links to, to, to wildlife, all kinds of different ground covers and grasses and things. The average list has over two, 200 species. Okay, so this is a robust list of native plants that are native within your area and have high probability of, of working. And the way that the information is organized, um, you can tell which ones are, are commonly in common cultivation and which ones are, um, are more difficult to find and so forth. And we've also been adding data for um, for animals, so you can see what animals that might be, native animals might be found in your, in your area. Um, and this is a work in progress, but we're moving forward with that. You can also get um, information on, on habitat, so if you're interested in actually doing restoration, restoring a, a pine flatwoods or a music hammock, or if you live on the barrier island. Um, and so you can get lists of plants and as well as some guidance about different um, different habitats. So this is the hammock like at Orchard View. And here's a list of the kinds of species that would be appropriate for my garden if I wanted to build one of those ecosystems. All right, so we're going to close with uh, who cares, right? <laughs> right. So we, you know, just to acknowledge that uh, there's a million species that are now um, estimated to be threatened with extinction. Uh, we have to deal with climate change and sea level rise, invasive species, and so forth. I mentioned before we're in the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, and um, which goes through 2030. 
And what's important to understand is that um, what happens locally actually has a huge impact on, on, on everything, right? So we all, we, we, we think about, at the global level, we think about big projects and big things that are going on, but it's actually the cumulative work of thousands and millions of individual actions that for biodiversity and for native ecosystems means as much as all of that other stuff. So um, what happens, what you guys do, uh, has a huge impact on the future. And especially the future of a city like Delray, where we know that we're starting with very little. There's very little that remains of, of what used to be. There's very little biodiversity. But, but the stuff that we have is critically important. And I want to really commend the city for starting to realize that these little remnant bits of native vegetation, as degraded as they are, 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 are jewels. They're really super valuable and have begun the process of restoring those, of, of bringing back the biodiversity that has been lost to the city. So uh, we, we greatly appreciate the collaboration with the city and, and uh, the work that's ongoing. Okay, so I'm gonna close there. A reminder, we have an event. We're also gonna have an event at the Municipal Beach on May 22nd to look at the Beach Jacquemania. Um, that announcement is not out yet, but um, if you go to our website, it'll, it'll be announced fairly soon. All right, thank you.